Hi, everyone, and welcome to Talks at Google. My name is Salma El Shahid, and I'm from the communications team at Google in, the, in Southwest Asia and North Africa, otherwise known as the Middle East and North Africa. And I will be your host this afternoon or morning or wherever you are in the world. Today, we have a woman who has played many, many roles on and off screen. Fatima El Banawi is a film star writer, director from Jeddah, Saudi Arabia, the only city in the world where a taxi driver offered to give me money because I didn't have enough cash for the fare. Jeddah, I love you. She is also one of the architects of the Red Sea Film Festival, the first film festival in Saudi Arabia, which just had its first edition this last December. Now, many of us saw Fatma for the first time in the hilarious and feel-good film Baraka Meets Baraka, a romantic comedy which became Saudi Arabia's submission at the 2016 Academy Awards. But before her career in film, Fatima studied psychology, which then led to her work with victims of domestic violence in the Family Protection Society in Jeddah. Soon after that, Fatima got her master's degree at Harvard University in theological studies with a focus on women, gender, and Islam. Parallel to all of this, our guest today started a project to preserve the storytelling heritage of her hometown, which we will hear about more in a second. Now, before we get started, here's a quick video to tell you more about that project. Hi, my name is Fatma al -Banawe. I'm bringing this project to you from my hometown, Jeddah, a city on the Red Sea, in the western region of Saudi Arabia. Just like yourself, I recall how stories impacted me, how my grandparents' stories struck me as real, how films and novels felt relevant, and how the connection with their characters was emotionally demanding, how they weren't only relevant or relatable, but sometimes personal too. On September 25, 2015, I share with my circle of friends and community members my intention of launching a storytelling platform in Saudi and I ask them to support it. Stories bring us closer to each other, to the space we share and to ourselves. We can foster the human connection between us when we recognize who shares the space with us and what their story is. The Other Story Project aims to collect real life stories directly from the people. All the stories I've been collecting are anonymous, handwritten and maximum A4 page long. For the lack of a public space, it was very difficult to reach out to the general public as I wasn't able of installing the story collection stands next to Belila stands or Red Tea vendors along the strip of Jeddah's Corniche, for example. So I begin visiting cafes, universities, bazaars, exhibitions, homes, any public or private space that I can reach out to people and ask them to share their stories. And so they did. I begin to have supporters, both storytellers and collectors and stories begin to unfold. I spent almost a year collecting stories in an envelope. However, to accommodate the demand, the envelopes are replaced with story collection stands that I can move easily around town. With the increased demand, more story collection stands are introduced. Today, the project is preparing to publish the first batch of collected stories for the year 2015 and 16 in what would be the other story book. Through this book, we can together break stereotypes, enrich the conversation, and humanize the experience. But to do so, I need your help. This room is filled with stories to be heard and to be read by you. Wonderful. All right. Without any further ado, I introduce Fatma El Banoui, who's going to join us right now. Hello, Salma. Hi, Fatma. Hello, Welcome Fatima. to Google. Thank you. Thanks for having me. 
No, thanks for thanks for being with us. Now, first of all, how are you? I'm doing well. Thank you so much. Wonderful. All right, so Fatma, we're going to start with a bit of a existential question. Now, you've mm -hmm. worn many hats, right? You've had many jobs. You've worked in social services. You studied psychology, then religion and gender and film. Having had all these experiences, would you say life imitates art or does art imitate life? Hmm. I think it's really a synergy, a very harmonious one between both. Um, life cannot, I mean, art cannot exist without life, right? It stems from it. It's uh, inspired by it. It's triggered and teased and moved by it. Um, and vice versa. Like, I remember in lockdown with the pandemic, life did not exist without art. We all resorted to art. We all relied on art to give us life, to give us a, sen a sense of meaning, a sense of connection. Uh, we were all either creating or consuming art. And I think during that time, especially, I recognize how important art is for life in a way that was un, um, you know, I knew, I knew of its importance. I knew of its significance. I was a creator of art. But during that time, when life almost stopped, uh, we all were either artists or first consumers of art and uh, all types and forms of it. Absolutely. And the pandemic was was a point of reflection for all of us. Um, so we just watched the video about other stories. Um, I'd love to know, what did you learn or what did other stories teach you? Um, and what's a piece of advice um, that you can share based on the stories that you read um, in, in other stories? Wow, um, the Other Story Project was really a significant turning point in my conviction and my, um, you know, sticking to what I really believed in. But it then, which was to bring me even to the to to bringing it to the streets of Jeddah to. Um, you know, sticking to uh, convincing people to even take the step towards telling their stories. That was the first and most difficult aspect of storytelling sometimes is to uh, be courageous enough to tell it. Uh, not the other, not someone else's story, but your story, the other story. Um, and I think what I learned after doing it or after taking it to the streets of Jeddah was. Um, is sticking with me up till this point. I mean, we're we're very different. But we are more similar than we can ever imagine. And um, you know, when I first started the project, I said it highlighted you know our shared humanity, and I had that more so as you know a hope, wishful thinking. Um, some could say it was more of a theory, but the other story really, really showed me and proved how much. We shared humanity. And um, I think what I what really sticks with me today is the performance pieces that stemmed from the other story. So what I did was I went to the streets, collected stories, and what you saw in the video using the story collection stands that sort of toured uh, Jeddah City. But then I took these stories and started creating scripts. And in these scripts, I made it feel like uh, one story bridged into another. And so there was like a process of weaving um, in a sense that when you are attending one of the performances, you feel like there's only a single protagonist. While in essence, there were 15 different stories in one performance, five different stories in another performance, six stories in a third. And at some point, everyone was like, hold on, when does my story, when does one story end and the other begins? And I think that's what I learned, is that we all um, sort of cross paths and our emotions, our experiences are, as much as they are personal, they are very naturally and organically universal. 
Um, and, you know, those uh, convictions or, or revelations that I had were, uh, were stand still and strong today. As I work in cinema, for example, I try to emphasize going personal in order to go universal. Um, and uh, it's it's sort of to respond to your question, Selma. I think it's more of something that I learned, but it's the advice that I would definitely share in return. That's what I learned, and that's the advice I would give. So, because you know how sometimes um, you know one of one of the most popular uh, the kinds of content on 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 the internet is you know what. What did we learn from people in their 80s or people who, you know, are in retirement homes? What have been their biggest regrets? Um, But what I would love to know from you is what do you think was the biggest or from your from your experience on the project? What has been the biggest barrier that stops people from sharing their stories? Um, Being convinced or being you know, coming to terms with the fact that you went through that and wh- whatever that story is or experience was, it was you that went through it, I think is needs or requires a lot of courage. Um, a lot of times we go through experiences and life is full of, you know, ups and downs. Um, and it takes so much courage to j- just talk it out. Talking it or writing it allows you to register it, that you went through it, that you recognize it happened, that it took place. And I write this in the book, actually. I I write about how it requires so much courage to submit to accepting that you're the one who went through that. It could be that you were bullied, but it's hard, harder to write that you were a bully. And you know, it's okay, and sometimes we talk about divorce, for example, but it's hard to confess that you were the one going through it. And it only happens when you talk it, when you speak it to either someone or when you write it down with your own hands. And so the moment I saw those people sort of holding the pens and taking about that moment of looking at that white, plain page in front of them, um, there was a pause and I saw it because the other story took place in front of me, you know, really the collections unfolded in front of my eyes. And there was always that point where someone tells me, I don't have a story. And then I'm like, really? And the most intimate and funny moments was when someone comes to me after they have written their story and after they had first told me they don't have a story to tell, with a page full of text and their and their last lines uh or sort of the last paragraph has their lines very squished and squeezed together as an indication that there's no more space and so they're just you know squeezing all the letters together um and showing me a, a sort of a manifestation of oh my god and i'm like oh so you do have a story um, and, and those moments were, were intimate moments, were moments of courage, moments of, of, of recognition, of, you know, realizing that you do have a story, several of them. And the most intimate is when you realize that it's not the story that, that you thought everyone knew about you, but it's another story. It's the other story that you yourself didn't even imagine it would be that story you would put when someone asks you, what's your story? That's beautiful. Um, to everyone just who, who had just tuned in, uh, we're talking about the Other Stories Project with Fatima al Uh Fatima, off of that answer, um, to anyone watching right now uh, who wants to tell a story or their story, and mm-hmm. they're worried, they're worried about how people are gonna you know, perceive them, um, they're worried about a bunch of things, what would you tell them? Um, that it's courageous if you tell your story. And um, as uh, Brene Brown, she says, you know, courage is um, embracing your story with love. It's really um, admitting that this is the story you went through. And it takes so much uh, self-love to do that. But it's the first 
step, right, into, you know, your awareness uh, that could lead to acting, um, to taking necessary steps towards that story. Uh, the one thing that I realized after telling your story, after writing it down, is that even the most painful stories end with a pat on the shoulder. Like, it's okay. You know what? I made this. And if, if I made it, if I took that, if I experienced that, then you will be able to do that as well. And I think there is a very natural or organic uh, pat on the shoulder that comes even after the most difficult stories are shared. Uh, so it might start difficult, but it ends with, with a pat on the shoulder. And sometimes that's what we need. 100%. That's great advice. Thank you. Um, okay. So I know other stories uh, has heavily influenced your work in cinema. So let's jump um, to cinema. So a lot of us came to know you from Baraka Meets Baraka or Baraka Yukabil Baraka. Um, yeah. To people who don't know, it's one of the first or not if the first Saudi rom-com um, to come yeah, out of Saudi Arabia. Okay, perfect. And the movie, despite being a rom-com, it handled some pretty important themes like authenticity in the age of social media um the social and economic, you know, uh, differences that exist in Saudi society and all society. Mm-hmm. Why a comedy to talk about these very important themes? Um, I think sometimes, you know, laughing get out uh, helps, <laughs> um, especially visually, you know, um, a low monotonous sort of, you know, uh, slow uh, genre. Uh, would be heavy. Even if you're tackling the same topics, as you said, that are naturally uh, put forward in, a, in that manner, uh, comedy allows it to be uh, digested easier. Um, you know, a lighter tone sometimes helps address uh, in addressing uh, difficult topics. And naturally, when you're even, you know, on on yourself, when you're frustrated or when you even look uh, towards your past, uh, you laugh it out. It's an instinctive sort of manner or mechanism that humans resort to when they want to tap on previously untapped topics or topics that are heavy to digest or heavy to be taken in and and, and accepted, uh, especially in cinema. And I think especially at a time where we didn't have as as Saudis uh, a platform as cinema. Uh, like we do today. So I think the genre plays a powerful impact on um, on whatever topic you bring forward. Uh, it's it's sort of the, the way you package uh, the topic it plays a role in um, uh, receiving it from the viewers. And I think it was, a, a, although, you know, uh, the director, if you speak to him, I think we first used the word coming of age. And no one from the viewers or the media actually packaged it in a coming of age uh, film because they were ready to receive a rom-com from Saudi and maybe they had enough of, you know, the other side of the Saudi narrative that a lot of us were sort of used to hearing. It's just about packaging, I think. <laughs> I'm glad I'm glad it was packaged that way because it was brilliant and hilarious and I just loved seeing a feel-good movie come out of um, a region. Now, um, since Baraka Yukabil Baraka or Baraka meets Baraka, I know that you've portrayed several uh, varied and different roles. Now, I know this is like asking you who's your favorite child, but bear with me, okay? What has been your most challenging role to date and why? Hmm. You know, surprisingly, a lot of the very challenging roles are the most similar to Fatma and either looks or culture or, um, or you know, an actual resemblance of someone who I know or who, uh, you know, went to a similar college in Jeddah. So, for example, I have a film coming out uh, on March 10th 
it's called Champions. It's a remake of a Spanish film called, uh, you know, it's uh, Aptal or Champions. And um, the the role I play is of a girl that goes to uh, Dar al-Hikmah uh, University in Jeddah. Although I went to Ifrit, but I know of the Dar al-Hikmah culture and, the, you know, character and whatever. And um, it was, it was uh, challenging because I also don't want to show you Fatma. I mean, I'm not playing the role of me in the film. I'm playing the role of someone who's completely different, has her own goals, struggles, character build up, uh, you know, uh, motives and convictions and all of that. And I don't want to show you myself. I want to show you the character I'm playing. So surprisingly, the most difficult roles were roles that were very similar to myself, or at least that didn't require a change of character or dyeing hair or cutting hair or playing with makeup or or uh, or costumes and so it's very interesting that i'm actually hearing myself say that now <laughs> but um it's uh i mean on a on a psychological level i think we can go with a different answer because uh, for example the role i played in an egyptian drama uh called 60 minutes uh is um was very psychologically draining. Uh, I played the role of a woman, uh, middle class woman who was experiencing uh, postpartum depression and uh, was resorting to therapy to go over that or to you know uh, overcome her experiences with a child in her hand and a husband who was not accepting of the fact that she was depressed after you know giving birth to a beautiful human. And uh, she went through these struggles and she was committing um, suicide because she gets harassed uh, by the therapist. Uh, with, with all these dramas there, it was very, very draining to experience and act, um, you know, suicide, uh, for example. Uh, it was, I remember, you know, really crying after uh, doing the first take of, of one of the scenes while you know you can't be crying in the scene because you're dying at the same time the emotions that were kept with me after we shot the scene uh, were deeply felt and I just had to cry it out and you know be thankful and be grateful to uh, to what we have in life to the support systems to the importance of having a support system. Um, and I deeply connected with anyone and everyone who was going through circumstances like that, especially that I did work with victims of abuse, for example, in Jeddah. And it was a moment that I, uh, it was like a turning point in my life as an actor, but also on a personal level. So sometimes little scenes are, are leave a, a great trace or a great impact on you. Yeah, um, and hear you out about, you know, being grateful and um, it must have been extremely difficult to go through that and uh, let alone, you know, representing people who might have gone through that in real life. Um, thank you for sharing that with us. And also about the, about the roles being similar to you being the hardest, it makes a lot of sense because like when you're acting, you want that big barrier that kind of helps you kind of get creative and, you know, like be someone completely different. Um, so, which brings me to my second question. Um, we talked about your most challenging role. I'm, I'm wondering what have been the roles that seem most natural for you or you felt like you had, you know, a lot of fun portraying um, or things that just came naturally? Hmm. Uh, yeah, I, I have a response to that one. <laughs> so it's the film Route 10 uh, that was filmed in uh, the empty quarter between, I mean, in the Emirates, um, sort of a highway. Uh, the film features myself and Bara Alam, who was my co-star, and it's a performance-oriented film. Uh, brother and sister takes uh, take the road uh, heading from Riyadh to Abu Dhabi. It's not yet in theaters, but it was actually a film that was shared in the Red Sea uh, or screening in the Red Sea Film Festival, and um, it's a thriller. 
uh, with a lot of scenes that required a lot of action, jumping, uh, creating movement, and it was supernatural. I mean, uh, like I remember the Q and A on stage uh, addressing this film, where were coming right after the screening of the film in front of the audience. I was reminded of a phrase that my dad always. Uh, said about me growing up was like El Girda, like the little monkey we have in the house, or my mom under the dining table, like would be like, we have a little kitten in the house. I mean, this was me, like you know, uh, five, six, seven year old Fatima. But it was as if there was that child in me that resurfaced with the requirements of a new character I was playing. Um, she was like a little action woman, you know, and you're reminded of the little child in you, uh, you bring it back, you bring different elements of yourself that sometimes they're often, you know, you let go of um, in different circumstances or different situations in life. And sometimes you just forget that they ever existed. But then you're put with this role and you're like, oh my God, this is super fun and I could play. Um, and even the stunt coordinator, I remember, was commenting. He's like, you know, I look at you and I could never imagine that you have that in you. Uh, I think they were really scared that I would um, let the stunt do a lot of the scenes. While in fact, after finishing and wrapping the film, <clears throat> I did all the stunt scenes myself because I was like, listen, I signed up to do this film because of these scenes. They drew me. Um, forward and so it was as you said an organic sort of um impulse yeah yeah the legal <laughs> team must not have been very happy about you wanting to do your own stunts <laughs> like the life <laughs> of course with all the measures and the security and the yeah, safety um you know put in equation but you you sort of take things responsibly and uh have an open communication with the stunt coordinator, with the director, with the requirements, um, re you know, asked uh, of you, and then you assess. And if it's something possible, then you go about it. If not, then, you know, there is a professional team behind you. That's wonderful. And it, I'm so happy to hear that, you know, um, clearly you've worked with um, pretty, um, pretty uh, sophisticated productions, right? Like um, being able to have like a stunt coordinator and then you know, creating that safety network to make sure it, yeah. you've worked with massive production houses, international and local, um, which brings me to my next question. Given your experience in film, do you agree with the following statement? There is an underrepresentation of women in film and especially in writing. Wow. <laughs> I mean, there is an obvious reason why I'm writing now, right? Um, you receive so many scripts and um, there's great potential, especially for women characters, but it's as if there is a hesitation uh, to build those characters even forward, uh, to even um, put them as we are, because we're different, we're eclectic, we're, we have different backgrounds. Um, and each one of us with all these different backgrounds and all those differences um, are multi-layered. I mean, we're not flat. We're not, uh, you know, um, we're humans and humans are powerful and multi-dimensional and, and we have our struggles, our fears, our emotional ups and downs and all of that. And if, you know, the whole universe says women are highly emotional, but I don't see that in the scripts I read um not the emotions and not the manifestations or the representations of the, these emotions it's as if they have specific roles and specific functions and therefore specific emotional spectrum that they can experience so i'm really nowadays invested in changing that hopefully i know there are amazing women that are doing the same thing, amazing men that are trying to push that envelope as well. Uh, but there is a significant room for change. Um, and I say this as I am preparing for, you know, different uh, pitches and scripts that have that already um, within them. And the one fear I have the most is 
to be surrounded with a production team or that is, you know, created of like-minded people that do not wish for that to, to manifest. And that's another struggle, I think. Uh, I've had several times on sets where I say, you know, on sets or even prior to sets, which I prefer uh, to have the discussion when I'm reading the script. And I say, okay, can we like discuss this scene? And they're like, yeah, you know, like, what would you do? And I'm like, what would I do? Like, you just told me I'm a, you know, the character I'm playing is a powerful, like, doctor with a vision and is ambitious and is living alone and she's, you know, uh, navigating life. And then in this scene, she's quiet, silent, has no role to play. And I'm like, why is she even in the frame in this case? Like, don't put me in the frame if you're not ready for me to implement everything that this woman uh, is. And it's so funny because they're the ones giving me the traits of these women. And then when you want to manifest and be those traits, they're like, oh, sorry, I don't think this woman does that. And I'm like, why? Because you're not used to seeing a woman fight or run or, or explore or push back. And maybe it's wishful thinking for us but it's real um and and i think you know there's nothing stopping women from putting themselves out there and in most beautiful ways i mean it's not to say that we're gonna change an entire discourse but it's just to put more of us out there yeah what happens or what do you envision happening when more women tell stories and when more women write women? We, we see ourselves. I mean, that's the most important thing, like to see yourself. Why do you watch cinema, right? I mean, why is it the most, one of the most powerful forms of art? It's because you see yourself and you relate. Um, I grew up watching, um, you know, protagonists, you know, child protagonists in, in different Hollywood productions that I related to. Um, maybe I didn't relate to their environments, their setups were very different, the struggles were different, but I always related to that special child in a film or another. I repeated and put rewind and watched the film like 14 times in a row and memorized the dialogues. But I want to make those. Saudi, Arab, um, closer to us, um, girls and women alike. Uh, and, and it's so important to see yourself, to feel the feelings that um, you might have repressed or, you know, shied away from. And it's, it's your chance to feel those feelings. I mean, maybe not, not as you're in, in, your, in your life, but in front of the screen. It's another opportunity. It's like an escape. It's fiction, um, but it's it's room for uh, touching one's heart. As a consumer of films, and as an Arab woman, I cannot wait to have more and more Arab women do what you're doing. And if there are any Arab film women filmmakers watching this now, go and write that script, because yeah. there's nothing more refreshing like what you just said, seeing yourself on that big screen and seeing your yeah. struggles and your demons and the things that make you happy it it's beautiful and i agree we are definitely headed in that direction yeah. um moving on to um what you what all the things that you've done so there's this really cool podcast called second life um and it's a podcast where the interviewer interviews women who had major career shifts, right? And usually it's just like they'd, they'd be in, in job one and then move on to job two. But with you, you've went mm -hmm. to job two, you went to three, four, and five. So you've worn many hats. Um, if someone is curious about something that is entirely different from what they're doing right now, what piece of advice would you give them to help them make the jump? I think any jump you make seems more of a jump than it really is. When I studied psychology and then studied 
theology uh, with a focus on women and, and Muslim communities and gender representation and Arab representation. Um, people thought, what does this have to do with, you know, that? And I'm like, what? I mean, psychology is the study of human behavior. Um, and then I became curious and interested to investigate that further, but with a special focus on women and their psyche and their behaviors and how they're being represented in society. Um, and so it, it led me to that. And it happened especially more so after I worked with victims of abuse at the Family Protection Society. And then when I graduated, I starred in Baraka Meets Baraka. I saw all of that depicted in a script. And I said, okay, I have a route. It's either I pursue my PhD, continue in the academic track and have that journey for myself, um, or I go to the ground and implement what I study, which was purely theory, I must say, um, on the ground and touch hearts and uh, actually change the discourse um, and have an impact, a direct impact. Uh, not just continue studying and continue theorizing. Um, and everyone asked, Fatma, you've been, you know, studying and you've been in psychology and then theology. What what brings you to cinema? And I'm like, what? I mean, how is this even a question? So for me, it resonated. Every experience led me actually to the next. And although they seem like jumps, they're completely in synergy. They're completely in harmony to, to the previous. Um, simultaneously, I started the Other Story Project with shooting Baraka Meets Baraka. It actually happened in the same month when I launched the film, uh, the, uh, the project, and we were shooting. I actually uh, collected a couple of stories from the set of Baraka Meets Baraka. And, um, and to me, it was storytelling. I mean, cinema is storytelling. And I, t until this day, I say I'm a storyteller, maybe through the medium of cinema, uh, sometimes through plays and theater, and more so, this is an organic, raw form of story collection, which happens to be under the umbrella of the other story project. So whatever, wherever you come from, whether you were a doctor, um, you know, a surgeon, an architect, an engineer, an artist, a painter, and then what comes next seems like a jump. It's because you there was a part of you that brought you to engineering that's linked to the next step. And I think what people need to do is to investigate that link, trace it down and see what brings you to the next step and channel it like bring it to the surface be proud of it i have a friend of mine hakim jama who was an amazing director and a fabulous brilliant actor who was a surgeon uh he worked in the medical field and i'm sure he went through the same question of like what hold on you're in the medical field what brings you to cinema i am sure if he traces it down he would find a link a direct link not even an indirect link to uh, what leads him to the next step. So if one just explores and digs deep into that, you would see that it's more obvious um, and more linked than you would have thought. That's really great advice because it also kind of gives me the impression that we can build on top of what we had. We don't need to abandon everything that we've worked on before. Exactly. It can, yeah, that's that's wonderful advice. Um, I have a couple more questions, so I'm just going to I'm going to I'm going to give you one more question and then we're going to move to questions from the audience, which are filling in nicely. So um, in a in an interview, I think it was a few years ago, someone asked you, what would be your dream job? And you said academic. Mm -hmm. Is that still the case? And if yes, why? And if not, what do you want to do? I mean, I. I like studying, I like writing, I like researching, investigating, uh, building parallels, studying dynamics, making connections, correlations. I'm, I'm like a geek by nature. I just love that. It's, it's in me. Even when I brought myself to cinema and these doors, you know, were opening in front of me, I'm still doing what I love, which is, you know, 
building these dynamics and writing and directing and, and, and sometimes, you know, producing and building teams and working with what I have. Um, I still do want to continue my PhD, um, to be honest, and I still do want to uh, maybe eventually like be a film critic, uh, studying what my works, but also the works of others and seeing what changes it brought, uh, how that manifested. Uh, I mean, as I was doing, as I'm working in cinema, I have been writing the other story book. And to me, that served a lot uh, of my other side, which didn't exist working on set, for example. Um, so I always try to balance it out. I always try to balance and speak to the different sides of Fatma. Uh, sometimes I'm a full-time writer, but then you would find me on set working as an actress. Uh, but the one thing that was a constant with me was writing the other story book. I've been writing for three years almost. And um, now, I mean, the book is in its final stages, but writing it served a big, big chunk of Fatma the academic. So it's not, you know, to say that I quit academia. It's just that um, academia is not Instagrammable. It's not social media friendly. It's there. It's not cool. So there wasn't much of that journey that I shared with people. But hopefully when the book comes out, it will be like a little surprise of like, ah, oh, she's still the Harvard grad. You know, she's still the Eiffel University grad. She's still that academic freak. And it's, it's, it's uh, you know, as I said in the previous question, there are different parts of you. And sometimes they manifest differently and in different stages of your life. Because you can't be one thing constantly or maybe that's me. I can't like just keep doing the same thing constantly. I'm more of the creative. I like to mix and match and see what serves the time I am in most. Yeah. 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 I mean, your passions don't need to be mutually exclusive. And I think that's a very good lesson on that. Um, some people, you know, they love focusing on that one thing and perfecting it for the rest of their lives. Other people like to have different things kind of like, like you said, in harmony with one another. Yeah. Um, yeah. We're going to jump into questions from the audience. But before we do that, Fatima, what is the best way to catch your news? Um, where can, when can we find out about your book? Where can you watch your movies? Um, is, that, do you, is, is it your website or your Instagram? Okay. Um, so on my Instagram, I would say it's really just my whereabouts like events, uh, things like that that I'm in, but more so my films. I mean, whenever there's a film coming out in theater, I always share on my platform on Instagram. Uh, that's the most um, you know used platform for myself. But in terms of the Other Story Project, it does have its own Instagram account, which is by its name, The Other Story Project. Um, I do have another account also, which... Um, uh, provides workshops that I give or collaborate with others and it's called Elfouad underscore creative and uh, Elfouad is my studio basically where I spend time writing and you know training or even where I have where I shot a full series called Al Shek on Shahid and um, it's a multiple purpose uh, space and it's derived actually Elfouad is the origin for the word Fuad which is the closest word to al-qalb meaning the heart and um, if you translate it to English it means a thousand valleys because there are a thousand valleys that lead to the heart and it's the Arabic uh, sort of or origin where uh, to the word fuad al-fuad um, and it's my belief system to uh, sort of the biggest umbrella I have overarching like all of my works it's to utilize the power of storytelling to reach the heart and you have a thousand valley to do so. You know, it's not only one valley that you can resort to. You, there are different jobs, different mediums, different platforms that channel the heart, honor the heart, and, and touch it. And that's what I try to do. I mean, with all the different works, I, I you know, um, put myself in. <laughs> Thank you for sharing that and for teaching us that. That's, um, I didn't know that. So wonderful. We're going to start with um, Mazen Sabag, who uh, sits in Dubai. Um, he asks about Nargis and Paranormal. How was that for you? 
Wow, that was an amazing experience. I had a guest appearance role in Paranormal, which uh, is derived from uh, amazing um, novels uh, by Ahmed uh, Tawfi, an Egyptian novelist who passed away a couple of years back before he saw the series manifesting based on his own writings. And I think it made a great impact in the Middle East, but also globally, uh, when the series came out, uh, directed by Am Salama. And uh, the role Nergis was um, a blast from the past. I mean, she was more so a ghost from the 40s. And I really enjoyed playing that because, you know, everything was a transformation. The setup, um, the scene buildups, although they were minimal uh, screen time, like, you know, it was a guest appearance role, but there was a complete transformation to myself. People didn't even recognize me uh, because there was, you know, I looked older, um, more like, you know, ghosty. And um, the attire was back from the times and and also it was with Netflix. So the experience on set, when people ask me, so that was your first Egyptian experience? And I'm like, yes, but it was with Netflix. So I was sort of partially Netflix, partially Egyptian, um, which speaks to, you know, um, my other uh, experience on an Egyptian film set were, were a show, uh, 60 Minutes, which was completely different. Um, Nergis was, I mean, like really uh, a nice role to play. And I and you see me a lot taking guest appearances. My other guest appearance role I took was in uh, uh, a feature film called uh, Rolem. And I, I played uh, a French woman from the 70s uh, casting like in an audition for a role and I, I love those because they uh, not only are they integral to the story at large but they enrich my portfolio and the roles I play the looks I appear in so it was really a great experience playing Nergis honestly um, our next question is from Farah uh, Farah asks, Hi Fatma, based on your experiences, is there any piece of advice you'd give your younger self or anything you'd do differently? Hmm. Uh, I would have kept all the videos and recordings <laughs> and actually took more care of, uh, of the child Fatma that played and acted in different works with her friends. Um, because, you know, we use these nowadays. I mean, this is like a CV and we just, you know, just because we didn't have an industry back then, uh, or whatever situation we were in, um, doesn't mean that these records are not important today. It would have been amazing. I mean, I lost a lot of that and I just sort of you know talk about it in interviews or share a bit of my experience as a child playing um different roles with uh, my fellow friends who well, actually one of them is shahad amin a great director uh saudi female director uh, and we used to as children just you know play and and write scripts and shoot them and have little videos um but we lost a lot of footage I, later, after that, I grew and I, I started my own theater with the, with a bunch of colleagues. And a lot of the footage is also lost. And what brings me today is, I mean, I'm thankful to, the, to those days. But I just don't have footage to share. It would have been amazing to have those. So whatever you have of, of your past, keep at least some of it. Because you never know what role, what, what you embrace and what you take on you know, on for, for to pursue in later in your life. And so it's your your child self is very significant to your adult self, uh, much more than you think. So preserve that. <laughs> you need her. You need him. I totally agree. We have 10 minutes left and we have a couple more questions, but I'm going to shamelessly inject my, my own question. Um, so <laughs> let's try and keep your answers to, as short as possible so we can get to everyone. Fatima, okay. if there's one, if there is one movie, um, for anyone who's watching now who's never been to Saudi Arabia, who's never, who's curious about Saudi Arabia, what movie or what movie or series would you recommend for them to watch? 
Um, there's Shams al Ma'arif on Netflix. Uh, it's by actually depicts like a, a boys' school uh, in 2010. So it's a little bit looking back. I think it's a fun sort of very so much fun like to watch. Um, another one would be maybe Had the Tar, which depicts an entirely different community of people uh, in Riyadh or in a, an area near Riyadh. Uh, it was Saudi submission to the Oscars last year. Um, I would also encourage people to watch some of my works <laughs> uh, that are available on Shahid, maybe 60 Minutes. Um, it's Egyptian, but also more Saudi uh, doubt, a shek, uh, which was uh, shot, as I mentioned, from my studio during lockdown. And I think it's a great case study for what filmmakers can do even in extreme limitations. Uh, yeah, I think that would be your go-to. And I second all of these suggestions. Uh, okay, going back to questions from the audience, uh, we're gonna go to Chantal. Hi, Fatma. Thank you for being with us today. Curious to know what story stuck with you that you're able to share with us today? I think Chantal is referring to other stories here. Yeah. Uh, so many stories. Oh my God, I could like keep going on and on and on, but... Um, some of them are rather short, like um, one of them is the most I receive uh, like an awe about, like always whenever I share that story or hang it in the story collection like gallery, uh, I hear a lot of like, oh my God, heartbreaking, whatever. And I'm, I know what they're talking about. It's the shortest story in the collection. And it's about a, a girl who uh, finally finds her love in medical school and thinks that, you know, life will be great. And then his mother says no, and it just says the end. And I'm like, and there's no continuation. There's nothing, you know, you don't even know what happens next, right? But sometimes the shortest is the most powerful. Um, and I talk a lot about this in the book. I say, what happens when the show, when, what nature of stories are the shortest and what nature of the stories are the longest? And the longest happen to be about uh, fear of falling in love or fear of commitment. And these are the longest because they're like, you know, I'm trying to get busy with like my work, my job, my whatever, and all of that. And I keep going on and on and on just to avoid falling in love. And I'm like, man, you could just like go and fall in love. It's okay. It's called falling in love for a reason because it hurts. It's fine. <laughs> uh, but, you know, I always say, and I talk about the contrast of stories and love does not only mean beauty and bonding and harmony it also means a bit of breaking uh loss doesn't always mean grief and failure and leaving and separation and also means growth and maturity and and and, and uh, connection and nostalgia and memories so whatever story that i have to provide i always have a counter story that gives you the exact opposite with a completely different flavor I cannot wait to read that book because, and especially to hear about the stories about love, because when you figure out how people love, you figure out how they live. It's, you, you get to know so much about a culture from, from um, their perception of love. Okay. Um, moving on to Dana Badar. Hi, Fatma. Thanks for being with us today. I'd love to know where you draw creative inspiration from. Hmm. Um, like human relations dynamics, unspoken relations, like, you know, unaddressed, uh, pent up, but like sort of too shy to address them. Uh, I, 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 I aspire to put those under the light, to shed light on these. Uh, these are the most uh, I feel comfortable to work with, like the fragile, intimate, vulnerable moments between people the closest to uh, each other, like uh, partners, uh, family members, siblings, uh, friends. I, I find that I have this, uh, you know, I'm inspired by them and they move me the most because maybe uh, they're unspoken about, like they're unaddressed. And um, I find great, uh, yeah, I find in them a great inspiration, honestly. Our final question for the, from the audience comes from Noura. 
Al Fayez. As a Saudi woman, was it very challenging to make the decision to pursue a career in film? And what were some of the challenges that you faced? Um, hmm. It was, I think, different uh, responses would go to different hats that I wear. As an actor, I think it was uh, challenging to first convince myself to be able to take the stand and say, I'm going to leave, you know, or not necessarily leave, but like shift sort of uh, gears and balance out my whatever was expected of me, whatever I was packaged in that hard, studious, academic, uh, you know, uh, woman uh, graduating from an Ivy League into a Saudi actress in a non-industry and, uh, you know, no film um, track record in her country. Um, I, it, was, it was a conversation that I had to have with myself. So that was the toughest. Uh, with myself to be able to face whoever comes next after myself, <laughs> which were a lot of people. Uh, but sometimes they're the closest. Sometimes they're the most educated. Sometimes they're scared for you. Sometimes they think that you're going through a phase. And you're like, you just need to comfort them that whatever decision you're taking comes out of a rational uh, conviction and awareness of what or where it might lead you. And that you have, you know, uh, prepared for the circumstances, sort of. Uh, so just to act responsibly, that's what I'm trying to say. Uh, in terms of writing and directing, I think um, I was actually yesterday asked this question about my writing role. And I say, you know, if you really know me, really, really know me, like you're, you know, one of my family um, members or my friends, you know that it's not surprising for Fatma to write. But it was definitely surprising for, for me to act. Uh, to, you know, t take that role. So for me, it's not strange that I'm writing. I just, um, I wrote creative writing back in times and later um, academic writing. Now it's more script writing. And again, it's just because I'm in this industry where it's in this mold, in this, you know, format. Uh, but writing is not strange for me. It's just that acting makes you... Uh, famous all of a sudden so you become famous for that role which is an acting I've been writing for four years no one really knows I'm writing I mean people know but it's not as celebrated as my acting roles because acting naturally transforms you makes you a celebrity a public figure with that hat so you just need to mix and match and speak about what you spend your longest hours doing which is writing um, no talk at Google is complete without this question, or actually, I, I'm not sure, mm -hmm. actually, I don't know if this is a question other Googlers <laughs> have asked. Um, what's your favorite Google product and, or one you, you really appreciate? And, um, if there is one thing you can change about a Google product, what would it be at the risk of angering thousands of Oh engineers? my God. Okay, <laughs> hold on. I need to put up, not like politician hat here. <laughs> <laughs> um, can you give me options? Like maybe I feel like it would limit my options. Like so Google I mean, personally, I love Calendar. I love Google Calendar. It makes me a better person. But there is Google Calendar. There's YouTube. There's Android. There's Google Photos, which is brilliant. Um, so there's Drive. There's Docs. <laughs> I, I you 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 had me at the Google Drive. I'm, I'm sold, done. I mean, I love Google Drive. Um, all the different features in it serve me as a creator of, uh, uh, especially in my writing. Uh, I just created my um, pre-production folder to share with all the producers and the DP, uh, director of photography and the art department and all the different important, you know, uh, heads of departments for my film on Google Drive. And we can all share. It's just a click of a link. And um, it's been really, really serving me big time. I mean, I can consume things on, on YouTube, um, but Google Drive has been um, a very significant um, element of my life. So thank you. I'm going to blast this talk to everyone I know <laughs> at Google Drive and let them know. 
Okay, so we have time for Google Drive. How about Google Drive? Can we like use Google Drive? Do you have a Google account? You know, it's always that question I I I suggest. I know they always they always want to get in touch with avid users, so uh, I'll take your comments. Um, we have time for one more question that just came in that I think is really cool. Um, it comes from Ali, and he asks, "Do you believe that Saudi filmmaking has the responsibility of being a driver?" of change or serve as a mirror of society only? Mm. I think there's no room for only. I mean, there's. I, I'm always not for the only, right? Or the always or the never, because they're just very limiting to opportunities and choices and chances. Um, I think Saudi has always been um, not only not um, underrepresented, but it was often misrepresented. And I think um, any Saudi would tell you that it was really a difficult uh, journey or a challenging journey, let's say, that shaped who we are as citizens, as Saudis, uh, internally and more so when we traveled. Because you, by default, were put in a position of becoming a, a spokesperson whether you were appointed or not it's just it happens and it unfolds um this position for you naturally on flights on you know in in different setups and and and, and um, places around the world and so there is always a, an extra layer added to whatever profession you have whether you're an engineer you're a filmmaker whatever so what i mean what do you imagine when you become someone who is responsible uh, to visualize life, lives, stories to create? I mean, it could be stemming from imagination, but then everyone would be like, is this, is this really Saudi? Is this your life there? Does it look like that? Are you a true, a true representation of Saudi? And so it's unavoidable in a way. And I think... Um, we need to act it smart. We need to be smart at not compromising uh, the creative element that you wish to instill in your film. So my purpose is to not create a Saudi film uh, or, uh, you know, like a film in Saudi or a film that has, you know, I just want to create a film that takes place in Saudi or that the protagonists happen to be from that country. Um, but when I position it with a Saudi film, there is immediately an expectation that this is a documentary. And it's not a documentary. Um, I mean, not even documentaries can be full depictions of life. We are 30 million people with a very vast, large, um, multifaceted uh, location. Uh, pictures, visually speaking, but also culturally speaking. When I go to Riyadh, it's completely different than when I go to Jeddah, when I go to the Eastern Province, when I go North to Al Ula, when I go South to Abha and Taif. Um, us Saudis feel this difference. So um, the, the, I think one thing that I'm very blessed to be experiencing nowadays is that we have always been very hospitable and we are naturally like that. So what we get today is the opportunity to finally experience and put to practice our hospitality and to welcome people to our country uh, for them to see it for themselves so that when we create films that are 80 minute long or 90 minute long we're not telling you that this 80 minute long film is Saudi but there is more to that and then you know with the filmmaking industry growing you have one film to tell you an, an idea and then another film to tell you a completely different idea about Saudi or about different protagonists that happen to be here. Um, I might, I mean, I, I, this is an entire like conversation that we constantly talk about. What films do we create? I hope I answered your question. <laughs> I, I love that you made that distinction between a Saudi film and a film in Saudi Arabia. Mm -hmm. I think that distinction is very important. And 100%, Saudi Arabia is so many realities for so many different people. And 
the realities are it's it's that it's that diverse even in countries that are small right even if it's a small country with like a hundred thousand people like there's so many realities there so let alone a country like like saudi arabia fatima this has been um it has been an absolute pleasure this has been an incredibly um Am I still muted? No, I'm not muted. Okay, can you guys hear me? Can you hear me? Yeah, okay, cool. Um, (laughs) This has been an incredibly important conversation about storytelling and preserving the heritage of storytelling in Saudi Arabia. Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. And thank you so much for the work that you do um, for Saudi stories and for Swana's Southwest Asia and North Africa. Um, It's been a pleasure having you at Talks at Google. And uh, we wish you the best. Do you have any closing remarks for your audience? Thank you so much. Thank you for this enriching and uh, great questions from the audience and from yourself, Selma. Thank you for, um, you know, hosting me and having this intimate conversation. Wonderful. And we look forward to having you back at Talks at Google. To everyone watching at home, thanks for tuning in. And uh, we'll leave a lot more details about everything we talked about in the description of this video. Have a lovely evening and day, everyone. Bye.